I wouldn't bet on that. <laughs> if you've been a parent, you realize that uh, it doesn't quite work out that way. You know, when I applied for this thing, I said, nobody wants to hear you speak, so I hope that's wrong. <laughs> All right, today we're going to talk about a clinical approach to complex problems. Have you ever found yourself in a situation where things seem so complicated that not only did you not know the answer to the question, you didn't even know what question to ask? Well, while this is not common in medicine, this scenario is not rare. You may think that your doctors know everything, and we may act like we do, but we don't. You know, clinical care involves some of the most complex decision analyses known to man. And I know when I get caught in this type of situation, when I get lost, I'm able to find my way back by using a tool based upon a clinical approach to complexity. This tool has three basic elements. Uh, first, we try to understand complex problems with simple models. But finding a simple model for most complex problems is difficult because the problem is complex by its basic nature. So we try to develop these models by looking backwards to go forwards. And for us in medicine, that means looking back down our evolutionary and biologic timeline to a time when things may have been simpler, simpler life forms, simpler situations. And if you can find a model based upon these simpler times, it may be applicable to current complexity. But maybe the most important thing is our last point. You have to recognize that all information is useful. You just have to know when to use it. And when you take this approach of understanding complexity with simplicity, looking back to go forwards, and recognizing that all information is useful, I think you're going to be able to get a handle on some of even the most difficult problems you face. I'm going to start with a story. Seven years ago, I was involved in the care of this young lady who was sent to see me because she had a weak heart and a crazy heartbeat. Uh, at age seven, she was noted to have this abnormal EKG with these bizarre and crazy heartbeats in the middle of the EKG. I don't expect you guys to be experts at reading EKGs, but you can see her EKG is very different from the normal EKG. Normal EKG being very regular and organized, and our patient's EKG being irregular and disorganized. This is a condition called polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, and it's often seen just before cardiac arrest. When your heart goes crazy, the electricity goes crazy, and your heart beats so fast that it effectually doesn't pump, and if you're not shocked by a defibrillator, you die. But despite this fact, for the next 15 years, our patient did great. Lived pretty much a normal life, got married, raised two kids. But at 22, she was sent to see me because she had a weak heart and her heartbeat was going even more crazy. We did a diagnostic work upon her, couldn't really find out why her heart was weak, but we did note when we stressed her heart, she would go into incessant crazy heartbeats. This is the EKG taken when we put her on a stress hormone isoproterenol. And now you can see the whole electrocardiogram is full of these crazy beats with the upper left-hand corner demonstrating what we call bidirectional ventricular tachycardia. Based upon this finding, we diagnosed our patient to have a condition called catecholaminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. You know, catecholaminergic, ah, you know what, I've said this term a thousand times and I always mess up. <laughs> so, 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 so let's call it by its initial CPVT. CPVT is not as complex as it seems. It just means when your heart gets stressed, it goes crazy. It's a rare condition. It was initially diagnosed, uh, discovered in 1975, and it was seen in younger patients in whom emotional stress or physical stress exercise seemed to trigger these crazy heartbeats. And in the subset of patients who had weak hearts, if they didn't get shocked, they died. So accordingly, we elected to put an implantable defibrillator in our patient. Implantable defibrillator is a device about the size of a pager. It goes underneath the skin surface, connected by wires, goes to the heart. And when the heart goes crazy, it shocks the heart. It's kind of like having a personal paramedic follow you seven days a week, 24 hours a day. We put her on medications and send her home. Uh, but two months later, I got a frantic call from the emergency room saying that our patient was dying, dying. She's going into these crazy heartbeats. She'd be shocked by a defibrillator, transiently convert, go back into crazy heartbeats, shocked. We flew her into our hospital, put her on standard medical treatment, but nothing seemed to work. Uh, thinking that maybe the shocks were causing her to get stressed out, because a shock is like having a horse kick you in the, kick you in the microphone, <laughs> kick you in the chest. And I turned off her defibrillator. 
I put her into an artificial a chemical coma, but she still had these long, crazy heartbeats. Her blood pressure would fall, and we'd have to shock her. It was a terrible time. Uh, it was really tough. Uh, we'd walk into a room, see her kids, um, her husband. Her husband would say, Doc, what's going on? What are we going to do? And I didn't know. I just really didn't know. I didn't went back on the medical literature, went on the internet, but I couldn't find any treatment options that were different than what we had been already trying. I did find out, however, that in many patients with CPV, CPVT, I can't even say that, <laughs> CPVT, it's related to a defect in an ion channel called the ryanodyne receptor. Ion channels are holes in the cell membranes that allow passage of electrical charges or salts. And the ryanodyne receptor is involved in what's called calcium-mediated calcium release. I don't expect you to understand this whole slide, but this is a slide of cardiac calcium transits. And a little bit of calcium triggers around, comes across the cell membrane, hits the ryanodyne receptor, causing massive amount of calcium release. But intracardiac calcium concentrations are not all mediated by ryanodyne receptors. There are other calcium pumps. There's calcium storage proteins. And in this upper left-hand corner, their ion exchanges like a sodium calcium exchange channel. And I said, whoa, this is getting too complicated. How can I get a simple model to understand what's going on in a patient? Maybe if I could understand how cardiac ion channels work, I'd get a handle on this. So I got this simple model of cardiac ion channels. And you can see in a single heartbeat, there are 12 major ion channels with currents going in and out of the cells. Uh, at different times, different parts of the heart have different ion channel activations, and I said, I'm lost. <laughs> this is it, you know? How can I find a simple solution to a complex problem? Well, this idea of approaching complexity with simplicity is not new. This is William of Ockham, who in the 14th century proposed what is called the law of parsimony, or Ockham's razor. It says, I gotta read this, pluratis non esponenda sine necessate. I don't think I pronounced it right. Uh, I didn't learn Latin in high school. I went to public high school. I went to Kala Elementary, too. <laughs> but as best as I know, this means don't make things more complicated than they have to be. Use simple models to understand complex problems. Like, I know this is an acronym, but when you try to figure out what's going on with your desktop computer and you make the mistake of unscrewing the back and then you see a bunch of wires and a fan and boards, and you're going, what the heck is going on? But when you recognize at the heart of the desktop computer is an integrated chip, and the basis of integrated chip is a switch. If you can understand how switches work, you can understand how integrated chips work, and you can understand how your computer works, unless you have an iPad, okay? <laughs> but how are we going to get a model to figure out the simple solution for our patient? Well, that's where we go to our second step. We look backwards to go forwards, and for us, in medicine, we said looking backwards down the evolutionary timeline. And we recognize that all life evolved in the sea. All life evolved in the ocean. Accordingly, the fluid around all our cells is like the ocean. It's full of sodium and chloride. And the inside of the cell is high in potassium. And this gradient is maintained through ion channels. Now, when you have a chemical gradient, you have electrical gradient. Electrical gradient is a battery. And a battery is a life source for important functions. We can use this to power things like intracellular communication and movement. All intracellular communication is mediated through ion channels. When you hear me speaking today, it's in part because my voice causes vibrations on your eardrums that cause auditory sensory cells to fire that pass signals down nerves via ion channels that are processed in your brain via ion channels. So when you don't understand what I'm talking about, blame it on ion channels. But in the same fashion, all biologic motion depends on ion channels. Whether it's walking, talking, or secreting insulin from your pancreas, all of these involve two proteins, actin and myosin, and the flux of ion calcium. As you can see in this slide, uh, with this animation, a little bit of calcium binds to the actin molecule, deforms it, and allows the myosin head to ratchet. This is the basis of all biologic motion, whether it's spinning of a bacteria's tail or a beating of your heart. All biologic motion is related to this element. And you know your heart's critical to keep you alive. It has to beat 100,000 times per day. 100,000 fluxes of calcium in and out of the cells. And given its essential nature, you know that 
we have a multiplier mechanism for calcium, and that's the rhinidine receptor. But in CPVT, this receptor becomes leaky. Too much calcium goes into the cell, and too much calcium causes crazy heartbeats through a mechanism called triggered automaticity. And too much calcium causes the heart cells to kill themselves, go into auto-suicide mode. You know, I said, I got it. This is it, Eureka, I got it. You know, it's too much calcium that's going into our patient's heart, and that's causing her heart to get weak because the cells are killing themselves. And too much calcium is going to the heart that's causing these crazy heartbeats. And, you know, if we remember that ion channel drawing, we have calcium channels, these LNT calcium channels. And they can be blocked with medications. You know, some of you, probably not you here, but maybe in the remote audience are on calcium channel blockers for treatment for high blood pressure. So I said, this is a great idea. We're going to put our patient on calcium channel blockers, and we're going to save it. So we put her on calcium channel blockers, and uh, things got worse. Her blood pressure fell. Things started to spiral out of control. Uh, we kind of stabilized her, and then as a last-ditch effort, uh, we sent her for a heart transplant. A heart transplant. We cut out her heart, put it in somebody else's heart. And after her initial stormy six months, she's done great continues to raise her kids. So I know what you in the audience are saying. Great story, understand complexity with simplicity, go backwards to see forwards, but you know, look, she had a weak heart, crazy heartbeat, you cut her heart, put somebody else's in. What's the learning point? What are we gonna get from this? Well, remember how I said everything, it, all information is useful. You just have to know when and how to use it. Well, three years ago, I saw a young boy who was brought in by his mom because he suffered a cardiac arrest at age four. He was riding a bicycle, got excited, same crazy heartbeats, cardiac arrest, got shocked, got put on medicine, slowed down his heart, had to get a pacemaker placed in age four. At 11, his family relocated to Hawaii. So his mom brought him to see me. I said, you know, ma'am, I think your son has um, CPVT. The mother was overwhelmed but thankful because for the past seven years, she'd been taking care of both of this boy and his brother who had these crazy heartbeats and nobody knew what was going on. And I said, well, while we have a diagnosis, we don't really have a treatment. We're just going to have to watch him. Uh, a year later, call from the emergency room. Our patient had gone out to his brother's birthday party, got excited, cardiac arrest, shocked. We flew him back to our hospital or something like that. We flew him to our hospital, uh, put in a defibrillator, put him on medication, sent him home. Frantic call from the emergency room, your patient is dying. He's going into these crazy heartbeats, shocked by his defibrillator, getting stressed out, triggering more crazy heartbeats, more shock. A condition now we know is called defibrillator-induced storming. And I said, you know, I've been down this way before. Well, there must be something that we're missing, something that we could learn. And remember how I showed you that complicated slide where the calcium transits in the heart and said that over in this top corner, there's the sodium and calcium exchange current? Well, the Vanderbilt group had just described using a sodium channel blocker to change calcium concentrations. Not a calcium channel blocker, but a sodium channel blocker to effectively treat patients with CPVT. Well, two patients. And so we said, give it a shot. Put the kid on the sodium channel blocker, and things quieted down. He still had crazy heartbeats, but not the long crazy heartbeats that would trigger his defibrillator that would cause him to get shocked and start to cycle all over the place. And I called his mom a month ago so we could use this story in our presentation. She said, everything's doing great. So when you get caught in a situation where you seem overwhelmed, where everything seems so complicated that you feel like you're in a maze, Maybe taking this approach to clinical problem solving would be helpful. Understand complex problems with simple solutions, simple models. Look backwards to see forwards. And recognize that all information is useful. Maybe you'll come to a solution to your problem. Maybe you even save a life. 